Thank you again for joining us this Friday for our Mingle Mastermind. And this week we are super happy to have on Rebecca Epstein from 15 Media, a boutique PR firm specializing in media relations. So thank you and uh, thank you for joining us today, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Good, good. And Rebecca and I are old friends. Uh, we worked together when I lived in Austin, Texas. Rebecca still lives in Austin, Texas. And uh, back when I had my Iron Daisy Design, which was a web and graphic design company. And uh, Rebecca and uh, even Brandy worked with us for a little while. So yes. yeah, so I saw uh, Rebecca doing some really great DIY PR posts on LinkedIn. And I just really wanted to introduce us to the fashion, introduce her to the Fashion Mingle audience. And I thought, you know, we really do need to have a talk about just like how uh, fashion businesses can improve their own marketing um, and just like really create a foundation for themselves. Uh, and then of course it is that you get to a point where you do need uh, more professional marketing. So I think with the three marketing ladies that we do have on our group today, we'll have a really great discussion. So Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Yeah, Rebecca, definitely PR is one of our most frequently asked questions and um, you know, it's something that's top of mind for every fashion business, especially now. So yeah. thank you. And um, I just want to let everyone know that Rebecca has graciously offered to give one attendee a free complimentary half hour. Session. So if you uh, think that you need more visibility and have one in-depth, uh, you know, half hour with Rebecca, um, you'll come out of it with your head spinning. Lots of great ideas. So uh, put in the comments just your name, your business, and we'll pick somebody at the end. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great. While well, everybody's still getting on, let's introduce our panelists. We have first up Kat Shore. Hi, Kat. What's going Hi, on? Are you busy with Worlds Open Day? How's it yeah, going? It's good. Yeah, we're we're getting all the speakers lined up, and UN is a little bit of a, a corporate uh, behemoth to work with and the bureaucracy. So I'm getting that hang of that so it's going to be a really tight elegant no commercial event and it's looking to be um about impacting the ocean and the fashion world and the art world and so it's it's getting to be an amazing event um i'm doing another uh models by models uh for 360 uh fashion network on the 30th and 31st so i'm getting ready to do that um doing about runway and about uh, you know the whole modeling world and how it's changing with post-covid so it's going to be it's it, you know the virtual world has opened up for me <laughs> that's great that's great glad to hear it um okay next we have dale noel from true model management hi dale how's it going hi beth thanks for having me today uh hi everyone i'm dale noel i am the founder and ceo of true model management and uh we are working with all types of models uh, virtually and in person soon. And um, like Catherine Schuller, I'm involved in the 360 Fashion Network Models Guide Conference that's coming up uh, next weekend, May 30th to 31st. So it's created for models by models, but everyone's welcome to join and see a little bit of the insider information about the industry. And we'd love to uh, share everything among our peers and love fashion mingle and networks that bring people together uh fashion innovation also has a great event coming up um in june and uh um, welcome everyone to join us everywhere we are <laughs> thanks dale and yes it's definitely all about collaboration um okay we have uh shereen Movahead. she is Fashion Mingles attorney, and she's also busy helping a lot of members in our community keep their business safe. Welcome, Shireen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Um, I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to hear about uh, what Rebecca has to say, because I know we all need a little PR in our life. That's probably one of my Achilles heels, so 
Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a fashion and business attorney. I help creatives uh, create a solid foundation for the successful growth and expansion of their business, anywhere from bloggers to businesses. So, so yeah, we're busy trying to help everyone sort of get back on their feet and um, you know strive through through the next period that we're going through. That's great. And do you want to men uh, mention, Shireen, the uh, upcoming webinar you're going to do with us on uh, B Corp? Yes. yes, absolutely. So, I mean, with a lot of, we had a lot of requests about uh, what we spoke about last week about the benefit corporation and how that can help your business, um, especially if you're getting involved with, you know, if you have a socially responsible business and getting involved with charities as an aspect of it. So we're going to have that on a June 12th. Right. Uh, what was the time? Is it still one o'clock or perfect? Yes. Yeah. So yes. still one o'clock, uh, June 12th, 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going to go in depth into uh, benefit corporations and how you can, um, you know, navigate through that to, to apply that to your business and, and get the benefit out of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that was definitely a topic that's been uh, requested a lot as well. So thank you for that, Shireen. And we have Lori Rivera, a super creative, uh, another person we could use to get some thoughts on how to market your business. Hi, Lori. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Rivera. I own the Rivera Agency, and uh, I offer PR and marketing and uh, event production for brands. And I'm super excited to be here today. That's great. And finally, we have the lovely Dee. I love your headbands every week. It's such a nice statement. How are you doing, Dee? Well, thank you. Um, hi, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. My name is Dee Rivera, and um, I am the CEO of DCG Media Group. So we do branding, advertising, production, pop-ups, and some other awesome thing. So, and Rebecca, I'm so excited to hear what you have to share. Thank you. We, we seem to have a little bit of a low volume coming from yeah, the I had to put my volume up because it's, do you hear me? I, yeah, it's just like, it's quieter than We're normal. Low, right? I heard yeah, for Lori too, but everybody else was pretty high. So maybe just adjust your audio settings yeah. to see if you can get a little bit louder. And so did, did we get it through everybody? We did, right? Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming. And um, um, I want to get started talking with Rebecca. Um, so Rebecca, one thing I'm really uh, would love to hear from you is just like how you got started in PR. Um, and also um, one of the things that you uh, do is that you work your you work like the back end side of PR for other PR firms and I think that's a really fascinating story to hear how that works so tell us a little bit about how you got started definitely so um I went to NYU for college and while I was at NYU I interned I was actually in the fashion world I interned at Vogue and Nylon magazine and then a PR firm called People's Revolution so when I graduated in 2010, which is, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years, um, I was still living in New York and I was looking for a full-time job. And, you know, I was applying to all these jobs. I'd done all these internships. And what I was noticing is that there were a lot of jobs that maybe were more freelance position positions rather than full-time positions. And so I started applying for those freelance positions thinking, okay, this would be temporary and hopefully, you know, as time passes, you know, I'll do these freelance positions, keep up my portfolio, learn a lot, and then find a full-time position. Well, fast forward 10 years later, I'm still essentially doing the same thing. What I realized at the time was actually PR firms really needed my help the most, and they were hiring me the most to do media relations. And so what I always say is I'm kind of like a ghost publicist, similar to a ghost writer. I'm behind the scenes doing all the pitching, reaching out to the media, and then they turn around to their clients and say, look at all these placements we got you. So I kind of do the legwork just because it takes so many hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then they pass them along to the client. And then to make a long story short, through doing all this work, and that still is really the bread and butter of my business. I work with about 70 PR firms across the country, all different industries. I've done a little bit of fashion here and there. Um, I did the PR for Magic, the big trade show. Mm -hmm. uh, in February with the PR from my work for. So I do fashion here and there, but it's not 
it's not all fashion. Anyways, about two years ago, I started doing DIY PR presentations as well because I just had so many small businesses that weren't at a point that they could hire a PR firm, but they wanted those few media placements to get the word out there about their business or get credibility. And so I started doing all these DIY um, workshops and online courses and stuff like that just to kind of help them get a few of those media placements so they can take their business to the next level. So that's, that's the gist of it. Well, what I love about your career is that you've got this insider knowledge of how all of these PR companies operate. So, I mean, you had to have just learned a massive amount from from just working with different PR firms and different kinds of clients. So I think that's super cool. I agree. I mean, I think that is something. So in my online courses and stuff, I teach what I call the open method, which is the four steps you need to get media placements for your business. And I always say that open method is all of the, all of the things I've seen over the last 10 years boiled down into what works and doesn't because I've seen so many methods. I've worked in so many industries. And so I've tried to really boil it down to be actionable and effective. That's cool. And I think that it's, it's super important for small businesses to understand how to do their own PR because you'll never be able to afford professional PR until you've laid the groundwork yourself. Right. I mean, I feel like that as a business owner myself. Yes, I agree with that 100%. You know, I think once you get to a certain point where you, you know, your time is spent doing other things or you have money to afford a PR firm, you should definitely make that leap. But in the meantime, while you don't have, you know, the resources, I definitely think you can get some of those placements on your own if you're willing to spend some time on it. Yeah, and I know Beth uh, agrees with me that like, we really hate that part of having a business where we're, we don't work very hard on the, on the PR side. And, uh, and it's definitely something that we, that every business really has to take seriously. So, well, I want to talk about, um, I mean, some of the things that like you really focus on is pitching the media. And I know, you know, we actually get this, this uh, question from our members all the time. Um, and I just had a designer send me her lookbook, you know, brand new shoot, the, you know, the, the photography was amazing. And she was like, Melissa, do you have any uh, magazines that, you know, would like to run this? And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, because like, that's not how it works. Right? <laughs> right, right. So tell us how, if you're a designer who has, you know, a beautiful collection, um, a, a, a great, um, you know, photography, how do you pitch the a media to get that first story about your collection? Sure. So I would really recommend, especially for designers, that the first step be to try to have themselves included in roundups. And what I mean by this is we all see those lists, you know, the five hottest shoes for summer, the six hottest sunglasses you're going to wear this summer. Um, no matter what site you go to, they have those lists. And honestly, that is a huge way that those media publications are staying alive nowadays is now they get affiliate links and they get kickbacks. That's why you see so many of these lists, you know, on People, on Vogue, on Teen Vogue, um, because that's their e-commerce portion. And the more, you know, people buy off that, the more kickbacks they get. So my first thing would be to really try to start getting yourself on those lists, you know, whether they're holiday gift guides or just roundups of the, the best fashion trends. And it's really, really not that hard to get on those lists if you know what you're doing. And so I would start small. I would pick five publications that would be your dream publications. Maybe it's Glamour, Refinery29, Pop Sugar. I would pick five. And then go through the sites and start paying attention to who's writing that list. On the top of the list, it will have a person's name on it. I would say most of the time nowadays, those people are freelancers and it's really easy to find their contact information. You just Google their name and a lot of times what will come up is um, their social media, you know, their Twitter profile and it will have their email address right in the profile or their writer's portfolio website will come up. You'll click that and you'll see a contact page and you just let the person know, um, this is my brand, here's some, you know, 
images. Here's what we have to offer. You just send them a pitch. I can, I can go into more details about what that pitch looks like. But finding contact information really isn't that hard nowadays, especially because there's such a huge amount of freelancers that write these stories. If the person, you know, you Google the person's name and they're not a freelancer, you can usually tell pretty quickly based off of their LinkedIn profile will come up and it will say assistant editor at Teen Vogue or, you know, something that indicates that they probably work at the publication full time. Um, and if that's the case, you can actually go to my website, which is 15-media.com. And I have what I call my media cheat sheet on there. That's a free download. And what it is, is the email address formats to all these publications. So you just plug in the name, you do a little bit of Google sleuthing, and you can probably figure out how to reach out to that publication. Because most of the people that you know work at Condé Nast, their email address is the same format. You just really have to right away determine is someone a freelancer or, or are they a full-time staff member and then go from there. But honestly, if you do that and you just pay attention to who's writing those lists, I know that you'll probably be able to start getting some placements on those lists um, pretty quickly just because there's so many of them nowadays. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's more uh, effective to get, uh, to get a response if you are uh, targeting a freelancer who's working for one of those publications or, or do, you, do you see any difference? I honestly don't really see much difference. The one thing that's nice in my opinion about working with freelancers is they work for multiple publications. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're pitching someone that's a full-time staff member at Teen Vogue, you're only pitching Teen Vogue. Whereas if you're pitching someone that's at, you know, that's a freelancer, then they're considering you for all the publications that they work for. And so I feel like in that way, it's nice. Um, I really enjoy working with freelancers, again, just because I feel like there's so many more options than if you're just pitching that full-time staff member. I love that strategy because if you're a small business and your time is limited, you're doing your own PR, that's a, that's a really great strategy just to make the most of your time. Yeah, and I mean, what I tell people that take my courses and stuff is that okay, you can do one of two things. Either decide I'm going to spend an hour a week just looking through the websites that I really want to be on and see who are writing, who's writing those lists that I think my brand should be a part of. And then you kind of just build your media list that way. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you see, I always say, look at your competitors too. See who's covering brands in your industry or brands that you follow. Like say, for example, you're, you're scrolling through Instagram and you see another jewelry brand or another shoe brand post that they were on Pop Sugar or Vogue. The first thing I would do is just look at that article, see who wrote it, and then pitch that person. So I think the main thing is you're, you're bombarded with media all day and there's times that you could think to yourself, well, why am I not on this list? Like my products are better than what's included here. Just remember, again, look who wrote it and see if you can find their contact information and reach out to them. That's wonderful. I, I re recently, uh, well, not recently, last year when life was normal, I went to uh, a conference where we, um, we had someone who worked for, the, uh, there were journals for, it was like Entrepreneur Magazine or, you know, in that one of those, maybe it's Fast Company, but she, that seminar was the most packed seminar out of every seminar of that conference. And basically she's telling everybody in the room, you don't have a prayer of getting PR, <laughs> you know? And so I, but it was interesting because it was like a really, it was, you know, she, you know, the, she was really um, just like trying to give everybody to set their expectations. Um, and I think that that's what's really important because what she was saying is just how flooded they are with requests. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that you really have to stand out. Of course, these were tech publications, so they have a super high bar for what they, you know, publish. Cause you've got, you know, this was a, a startup conference. So, you know, it's like everybody who's a tech startup and blah, 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 blah. So there's a definitely a big, uh, there's a high bar for that. But, um, what do you, but we, but we know all of these people get a lot of emails. So how can you craft an email that is going to get your email opened and not overlooked? Yes. So I have what I like to call my anatomy of a pitch. I include three things in my pitches. Well, before I even go into those three things, I would say the main thing is keep your emails really short and concise. 
No one has time to read a whole block of text, especially in an industry that's so visual like fashion. Embed an image into your the body of your email. You know, show people what you have to offer rather than writing a bunch of text about it. Of course, I would not recommend putting more than three images, but you know, you can, if someone's scrolling through their email and they see an image that really catches their attention, chances are that's gonna get their attention more than a lot of text. So the first thing is keep it short and concise. Another thing I would say in response to that person, and I do get it, these people get a ton of emails. And that's why you have to be consistent and keep pitching. That's why I recommend setting aside an hour a week. So you're not just sending out one pitch and leaving it. You're constantly kind of getting on their radar. And eventually they will, I really do believe, notice you. Um, I feel like people really nowadays, especially with all the stuff going on, want to support small businesses. So it is the time more than ever, I would say, to pitch yourself. Because people really want to support. But anyway, that's a little bit of tangent to my anatomy of a pitch. So the first thing is, I always recommend the first sentence of your pitch, state what you're offering. I'm offering sandals that are great for summer. I'm offering, you know, my line consists of sunglasses that are perfect the next time you go to the beach. Just kind of sum up your whole pitch in your first sentence and show like where you think that you, you would fit into it. So that's the first sentence. The second part is always what I like to call your brand summary. Just a few sentences about your brand. It doesn't have to be anything long. I say three to four sentences, you know, what makes you unique? Maybe you use um, eco-friendly fabrics or, you know, maybe the design behind your brand is really unique. Really think about like what makes me different from the millions of other fashion brands that are out there and include that in your brand summary. Then the next part of my pitches is I always include three options. In your case, especially if you're pitching kind of those roundups or product lists, um, you know, like say for example, you're pitching the sandals for summer, then I would include three of your best-selling sandals, you know, put the name of it and a low-res image underneath it, and then put, you know, the next sandal in a low-res image. Or if you're, you know, pitching the hottest purses for summer or the best beach bag for summer, include about three suggestions from your line if you can. I mean, if you only have one or two, then that's fine. But I would recommend giving people about three product options um, because I think that, you know, any more than three, I feel like people get a little overwhelmed. But if you only include one, then it's like if they're not interested in that one, then they, they move on. So that's kind of what I recommend is, you know, first say what you're offering, then include your brand summary, just a little bit more information about your brand, and then the products you would like to have them consider. Okay, that's really great advice. So, um, you know, people, because people get so many emails, I like what you're saying about, you know, spending a week, you know, every week, you're, you should be, pitching them again or just sending them a follow-up email how do you uh, how do you address it if you're not hearing back when do you give up on that particular contact yeah so I would say don't get discouraged because I've been doing this for 10 years and I've had my clients in most of the major national publications like even New York Times and Wall Street Journal and I still have times all the time where I'm just not getting any responses and so I, I would say just don't give up and don't feel like it's your fault because it's probably not. It's just you haven't found the right story yet that catches people's attention. Um, so what I really like to recommend doing is send out one pitch and then do one follow-up to that pitch. So say, for example, you send out a summer trends-related pitch this week. Well, then next week you could just follow up on that. And I would just send people, you know, another email and just say, hey, I sent you this information. Are you working on any summer trend stories? Um, as a reminder, here's this information. And then if you still haven't heard anything, then my biggest suggestion is move on to a new pitch. So summer trends didn't work. Well, do you have something that you can offer for Father's Day? Maybe a Father's Day gift guide. Or are you releasing a new product? Maybe that's its pitch. Um, but I find that you just constantly have to keep looking for new hooks, new story ideas, new ways to spin your brand. I really recommend not following up more than once, like move on to a new story idea. Um, okay. You know, you, you sent out a summer back to pitch, like just constantly start giving the uh, media new, new information. And I promise you one day you'll get something. Okay. And what I always say, you know, to with PR is 
really all you're doing is sending an email. So you're not, no skin off your back if you send out a few emails each week. And if you don't get anything, it's a bummer. But what if you spent that 15 minutes sending them out and you do get something awesome? So it's really just such a cost-friendly way to get the word out there about your brand. You know, you're not paying for social media ads or anything like that. So I would just say, keep trying, keep changing up your story and keep looking for new contacts. That's a huge one for me. Even, you know, so I'll pitch, like I work with a lot of beauty clients and I am constantly going back to like Allure and Pop Sugar, looking through the sites. And every time I look back, there's a new freelancer to pitch. I'm like, I haven't heard of this person's name. Mm -hmm. So um, don't give up. And unless some media person tells you that they're not interested or to take them, take you off, take them mm -hmm. off your list, you can keep sending them pitches if you're sending different story ideas, you know, unless someone explicitly says like, this isn't what I cover. I'm not interested. Don't pitch me, which, which happens. Don't feel bad. It happens to me too. Um, then you can keep sending them new story ideas just because they don't respond. Doesn't mean they're not going to be interested one day. Okay. Okay. That's great. And I'd like to, we have a lot of, you know, startup uh, brands in our membership as, as well as, you know, experienced brands. Um, but what do you think is like, you know, if from a, a person, you know, from the magazine standpoint, they like your pitch, then I guess the next step is they're going to go check out your website, right? So what are some of like the basics you need to have in place to make sure you look professional enough to actually get in a publication? Yes, this is a good one. And I have in my online courses, I have a whole section on this. But to summarize, you know, especially for new brands, I personally don't recommend pitching the media until you really have something to show. So I do think it would be somewhat challenging to get, unless you have a track record or, you know, you were really well known from something else that you're doing, uh, the media is probably not going to cover you until you're a real business, you are selling products, you have samples to send them. So I would be careful about that is make sure you have something to show the media. Um, samples are a big thing. And it's some, you know, of course, it depends what kind of business you are. But if you, you know, start sending pitches to the media, you might have people that say, Oh, can I have a sample of that? And that is a cost that you'll have to incur. When they're saying that they're expecting you to send them the sample of whatever for free and pay for the shipping. And I honestly would not expect to get it back. You know, if you really need it back, you can ask, but I kind of just assume unless it's something truly expensive, you know, really, really expensive, then you're just going to have to kind of send it to them because obviously they don't want to recommend something that they've never tried or interacted. So just know that they will send samples. Another big thing to have to look professional is make sure you have images of your product on a white background. Um, a lot of times, you know, I think people try to get really creative and artsy and they'll do these like amazing lifestyle shots. But at the end of the day, I find that the media never wants those because again, especially if we're only pitching roundups for right now, of course there are other stories that you could pitch later on, but if you're just starting on your own PR, I would recommend just trying to get on those product roundups for now. Um, you know, there's a list of products and so they want all the images to look the same. And so the easiest way to do that is just to feature an image on a white background. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another thing that I would recommend people having before they, before they start pitching the media. Cause once someone's interested, it could be a really short turnaround and you might not have time to, uh, to have those pictures taken. One tip that someone told me about getting those pictures, this was years ago and I still think it's really good. Of course, this coronavirus might have changed this, but if you need images on a white background, what you could do is you could go to picture people in the mall or one of those like JC Pen well, I don't even know if JC Penney's is going to exist anymore, but like <laughs> JC Penney picture or whatever. And I mean, you can pay them to take pictures of your product on a white background, which is a more cost effective way of you or, you know, you can't hire a photographer or get mm -hmm. all of that together. So that is something that you can do. In terms of your website, you know, I think the biggest thing, and I, like I said, I've done so many DIY PR workshops for a variety of different kinds of businesses. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes I have people send me links to their websites and they don't even have their own pictures on there. Like they'll have the products listed and it'll be stock images. And so that's kind of a big thing is like, in terms of your website, 
make sure you have some type of brand story. I find that especially if you're an independent designer, people want to fall in love with you. They want to fall in love with your brand. So kind of try to make your about page um, and have that on there. Make sure you have real images of your product and good product descriptions. And I think those kind of three things just show that you're a legitimate brand. Okay, that's really good advice. I, I went through the uh, similar with a, a client a couple of months ago with the photography, with the photography, they had a, a great collection, but their photographer was just like refused to shoot anything on just a plain white background because they wanted to be creative. And I'm like, no. And, you know, she ended up paying for a collection or photography that is not really useful, you yeah. know? So yeah. it's super important that you get that photography done correctly. Right, and it's not maybe the most fun to have those pictures on the white background. Like I'm even working on a project now that they're doing a social distance photo shoot today with like this book. And I and they had all these really creative ideas and I'm like, you're spending all this time and money to do all these lifestyle shots. And at the end of the day, the media is just gonna want a picture of the book cover. And so, you know, I think the lifestyle shots, don't, I'm not saying that never do them. You know, they're great maybe for your homepage or, definitely to use on social media or something. But in terms of, you know, the shop portion of your website or what you're going to be sending the media, they want to see the product. So you don't need to get too creative. Right. Yeah. You definitely need to have both. The editorials are fantastic. Like you said, for social media, you need that kind of content, but for an e-commerce site, and sending photos to the media to be potentially published, you know, on a website or in a magazine, you've got to have the white backgrounds. Right. Yeah. So, well, um, let's get to, well, first I want to ask before we go away, do you have any favorite publications that you think would be uh, the first place people should try to pitch? Yeah. So I have, oh, okay. I'm trying to think. So I have a lot, like, I like pitching Pop Sugar because, like I said, they do a lot of product roundups. Okay. Um, I also find this one might be a little bit surprising, but I also like pitching Forbes because they mostly only use contributors. Like they do have staff writers, but if you kind of pay attention to who's writing the stories, it's usually pretty easy to find contact information. Um, you know, they have a whole fashion section you can look through and you can kind of see, well, oh, this person, you know, covers women entrepreneurs in fashion. I would be a great fit for that. Let me pitch them. So I think Forbes is really good. Um, Reader's Digest. I mean, really any of the lifestyle sites, Refinery29, you know, they obviously pitch a lot of roundups of products. Any of those kind of like women's interests or fashion sites, um, I think are, I think, think are great to pitch because like I said they're doing so many of these product roundups yeah okay that's great so uh Beth has a question oh we oh, don't have your mute. um hold on uh, Beth you're uh, you're gonna have to unmute it's not working on my side okay how's that there we go. now we got gotcha. you Okay, yeah, we have a question. We have a couple of questions from attendees. Uh, Nicholas Rhodes wants to know, what are realistic metrics on sales if you're included in one of these lists? So this is a tough one. And I feel like this is kind of the million dollar question is, you know, I, I think this is what people, it's kind of a bummer to hear, but I feel like with PR, it is more about the credentialing than the actual sales. So you know, what happens is it's really hard to tell where sales come from. Of course, you could get a hit on Pop Sugar or Teen Vogue or whatever it is and see a small bump in sales, but then you put it on your website, you know, add a scene in Teen Vogue, and maybe that's the reason someone buys it. They're like, oh, that, that's credentialing. You know, if Teen Vogue said yes, then I'm going to buy it. And so I always recommend people looking at PR more as credentialing than sales because it, it really depends and it's you know, it's hard to tell, like, did you share that link a bunch of times on social media or in your newsletter? And that's why people are buying from that link. Um, so I always just recommend to think of PR really as credentialing, you know, it gives you something to share with your audience that you have been included in all these things. And then also put it on your website. You know, if you go to a website that has a lot of media, you think, oh, well, they must be good. And so sure, you might have an initial bump of sales from that placement but 
from there, you don't really know what's happening after that. Like if someone saw that, you know, later on and bought from you or they saw it because you were sharing on social media. So I always kind of recommend that people reframe the way they're looking at PR to look more at credentialing. And another big thing is SEO. So the more you're mentioned in online articles, if someone's searching for women's sunglasses, the more it helps your SEO. So I think that's a different way to look at PR and even what I recommend for my clients now, because there's really no way, unless, I mean, that you can guarantee a certain number of sales from a placement, even from big sites. Yeah, that's great. It's good information. SEO is definitely a consideration as well. Yeah. Um, we, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, it's crazy. And that's really a change that I've seen in the last few years. It, I have people hire me now just to get backlinks. And I honestly personally actually prefer it because, you know, they just want to be have back, like they just want the media placement so they can have backlinks. And I actually feel like that's a much better way to look at the benefits of PR than, than sales. Because I mean, again, I, there's no way in my 10 years that I can tell you for sure how many sales you're going to get based off articles, even articles in big publications. Right. Makes sense. Um, okay. We have a question from Andrea. Can you give us a couple of examples of great subject lines that you find work? Yes. Okay. Subject lines are a good thing too. So I really recommend with your subject lines, don't get too crappy. You know, look at websites and kind of, this might be a little bit hard and I, I go into way more depth of this in my online courses and more of like the presentations I do, but your goal should really be to anticipate what the media is going to cover. So you know that they're going to do a Father's Day gift guide. You know that they're probably going to do more, you know, summer trend stories. So you want to capture the most generic information in your subject line. Like don't get too crazy. You can just say, you know, bathing suit, trendy bathing suits for summer, Father's Day gift ideas. I always with my subject lines kind of try to anticipate what is the media going to cover? And I want to make sure that if they're working on this story, that they're going to, that email, my subject line is going to say, oh yeah, I am going to be doing a summer trend story. So, you know, summer trends, Father's Day, you know, 4th of July, maybe you make a red, white, and blue outfit. Um, keep that in mind. So I just try to make my subject lines kind of almost as generic as possible. And again, try your best to anticipate what the media, media will want to cover and include that in your subject line. Okay. Hope that helps. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, good, good information there. We have one final question from, uh, let's see here. Marcus would like to know, um, what about getting on talk shows and uh, any type of TV outlets? Is that something that should be down the road when you're established more? Should you start with the list or at what point should you try different type of media outlets? I mean, I honestly say go for it. So here's the thing with TV, especially if you're a designer. So I, I almost think that it's similar to online. I just always, like I said, recommend starting with online to kind of get the way that it works and there's more opportunity and stuff like that. But with TV, even like the Today Show and Good Morning America, they almost use freelancers all the time. Not necessarily freelancers, but they'll use like style contributors to do, you know, an Earth Day gift guide segment. So for example, if you see something like that, look at who did it and see if, okay, are they like a full-time reporter or are they one of these kind of like freelance style people? Because I actually know a bunch of times, um, you know, someone I heard talk last year, she's sort of a freelancer and she does these style segments all the time. So if you can find someone that you think would be a fit, then, then go for it. Um, but I would have your expectations in check that probably you're going to, your way to break onto TV is again, to sort of be part of like a, a gift guide segment or a segment with a bunch of other products. One thing I will say, I won't go too far down this rabbit hole because I feel like I've thrown so much information at you is also don't forget about your local stations. I don't know if you guys are all based in New York, um, but there, I honestly think, you know, don't forget about your local stations because most places, even New York has Good Day New York and has kind of their local um, morning show. And that's always a good place to start too. 
Okay, that that's awesome. That's really great advice. Well, let's get uh, turn this over to our mastermind team who has some questions for Rebecca, but also might have some tips for them for uh, as well. Uh, Dale, let's uh, get you unmuted. Yep. yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's your question, Dale? Well, first, thank you, Rebecca. Everything you've told us so far is just a wealth of knowledge and it's really great advice. I can't wait to try some of the tips. Um, my question is, uh, if you don't have a product and you're a service business, do you have any specific tips for service businesses when you're pitching? Yes, this is honestly like a whole, I can go on forever about this. Um, so if you're a service, there's sort of a few different things you can do. So I always recommend replace your knowledge with products. So instead of pitching products, you're going to be pitching your knowledge. So you're going to say, okay, you know, here are like the five, I'm trying to use an example for a model. Um, you know, here are what, what I look for in models. Here are five things that you should keep in mind if you are trying to book with a modeling agency or something like that. So you can kind of look again, you know, look for other people in your industry, see where they're getting covered. Like if you want to get media for your models, we'll look at some other people that are getting media, you know, look at some of the other models that are sort of on their same level that are getting media, see who's writing those stories and pitch them. So no matter what kind of business you have, I think the easiest way to start is really to look at your competitors, look at other people in your industry see who's where they're getting media and then pitch those same people. I think a lot of times like people kind of overthink it. And honestly, most people kind of cover the same things over and over again. So if they, you know, covered a model before, then chances are they're going to cover it again. So I think that's the easiest thing to do. Also, if you're in a service is just sort of look for people in that same thing. And then again, instead of, instead of products, you're pitching your knowledge, you're pitching yourself as a thought leader that can, you know, answer questions about modeling or that can, you know, uh, I work, I'm going to use this example because I work with a lot of doctors. So I'm always pitching, you know, things people need to know about X, Y, and Z, um, stuff like that. So you just kind of have to pitch your knowledge as if it was a product, if that makes sense. Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, okay, so uh, we've got Catherine Schuler. Uh, what do you have to uh, ask? Rebecca about. Hi, hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much. This is so fascinating. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on um, product placement with charities. Um, I have a charity, uh, Divabetic, which is about women's diabetes, and we do a podcast, and sometimes we have people pitch us about um, product placement for contests and things like that, and we have 3,500, you know, uh, attendees at our podcast. So sometimes we do contests with them. What do you think about product placement and alignment with charities, related charities? So this question I'm not 100% sure about because um, I don't know. I feel like I don't really work on that side. Are you saying like you would charge people to mention their product? No. No, but they, um, they pitch us on related things to diabetes and then we do contests, giveaways. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great way to do it. You know, you could also have, like, I'm usually on the other side. Like, I'm usually that person that would be pitching you. Right, right. Um, you know, and what I do, too, is, I mean, you could always have those people on as guests, too, where they could, like, yes. talk about the product or yep. not only, you know, their experience or stuff like that. So, I mean, I see it happen a lot, but I will say I find for podcast pitching, um, usually I'm kind of pitching more of those thought leadership topics than products. You know, I do some giveaways and stuff, but it's usually associated with, okay, here's a person, here's what they're knowledgeable about. Here's the topics that they can talk about in your podcast. And oh, by the way, they also have products. Are you interested in doing a giveaway? So, I mean, I do see it happen, happen a lot. And I, I mean, I think it's great. People love giveaways. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, uh, uh they write for our blog too. That's they perfect write? too, yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Shireen, uh, what do you have to ask? Let me unmute myself. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much. There's a lot of information there I was actually writing down <laughs> with fury. Um, you did ask answer some of my questions with regards to professionals, which is, you know, sort of the realm that I'm in, you know, how do you, how do you really pitch for a professional, which you kind of answered. Um, 
But also, I think there's also a question out there, and I thought I would bring it up to your attention. How do you protect your pitch? So, um, so if you've got a pitch that is unique and you're throwing it out there in an email, you know, traditionally the NDA is, is a form of how to protect, you know, when you're, when you're discussing an idea. Um, but in this case, you know, I, I, do you find that if you were to send an NDA, for example, with a great idea, um, that you would get a lot of feedback from that or, or cooperation on the other end? So that's interesting because I'm, I mean, I've never sent an NDA along with my pitch. I mean, I guess the thing is the most of the stuff that I already, that I pitch is already out there. You know, it's already on a website. It's already being shared on social media. So, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to copy something that is already out there. So, I mean, I've never, I guess I've never had anything that requires an NDA. Um, so I, I'm not really sure 100% how to answer that question because, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I never, I've never really come across it. And I, you know, I work with some pretty large, like Fortune 500 companies and we, we never send NDA with pitches. Hmm. Okay. Right. So, so it's, so it's good to know that if you do have a unique idea that's not already out there, um, probably the best bet is not to share that right away and maybe first have that conversation or the interaction before you before you release that information. Yeah. And I guess I'm not sure because I always don't rec I, one of the biggest things I recommend is like I don't ever recommend pitching ideas because I honestly find that the media doesn't cover them because why would they? You don't know if a media is gonna I mean an idea is gonna come to fruition. You know, they want to cover stuff that's out there that their audience can buy. So in general I always tell people like never don't pitch ideas because people won't cover it so I guess that's why I've never really run into that problem because the stuff that I usually pitch is already out there in the world um you know people already have that protection you know they have their copyrights or their patents or whatever it is um so in general I, I wouldn't necessarily pitch anything that's just an idea just because I don't think it's usually very mediagenic thank you that's very helpful Okay. Um, we have, let's get one more question. I see we've got uh, Rose uh, of Tessie's Tea is, uh, is attending today. And she'd like to ask, uh, find out if, about pitching food products. But I also wanted to bring in Dee Rivera because she's got a lot of uh, experience placing um, uh, products at some of the morning shows in the in the New York City media market and even a little bit beyond, beyond. so maybe you guys could talk about some suggestions on how someone like um, Rose who's got this fabulous tea uh, product could get that on morning television. Sure, so Rebecca do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? <laughs> oh you can go first that's totally fine. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much. That was some really great tips and I, um, ditto everything you said. Um, I think for morning shows, you know, what producers look for is they want a segment story. They want three points, five points, three tips, five tips. I always go by threes and fives. And if you kind of create the segment for them, and I agree with, uh, Rebecca creating a visual, you did their job. Like, honestly, that's what creates a really good relationship with producers is they want to be like, oh my God, we're going to just plug this right in. Um, that's really it for morning shows. And with morning shows, you know, now every, a lot of things are on Zoom. And I, I find that um, in some instances, it's a little easier now, depending on what the show is. Um, like I just booked a client for two segments for Fox and ABC. Um, and I've been pitching to these people forever. So I think now is the time to really strike while it's hot. Um, and to Rebecca's point, one of the things that I did want to share is, um, and this is just a tip to put it out there, you could also subscribe to Harrow, H-A-R-O, which is a great way where a lot of queries come in through a lot of different editors, different publications, and you could answer them directly so i think that's a way to kind of get out there and um to the point of to the question of the person who said well what about sales like rebecca said you're not guaranteed really press is just to raise your profile 
But if you want to do an advertorial, that's something different because that's more of a salesy editorial kind of angle where maybe you may get sales, but again, that's not guaranteed. So that's just something to think about. Um, and honestly, LinkedIn is my best friend. Like I link in everybody all the time. I get business through that. I get contacts through that. You'll be surprised. People do respond. Um, I do recommend that you subscribe as a business LinkedIn and pay for the premium because that gives you access to a lot of different contacts. And, um, you know, sometimes your pitch does get, I mean, I've, I've pitched ideas that then I see it again and I'm like, wait a minute, I never saw that on, you know? And so sometimes that happens. So I think there is no way to protect your, your segment idea or whatever, because sometimes they'll take it. It depends on your relationship with the producer or the editor. Right. But what Rebecca said was true. I think sometimes when you do pitch, be quick, be to the point and then create a rapport and a relationship with them because they might not take you now, but they may take you later, but it's really building a relationship without stalking them because everybody hates that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with all people. So, I mean, right, Rebecca? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I think the be, best thing you can do is just be easy to work with. You know, yeah. I, I hate to say this because I feel like you know, at the end of the day, the media is all on deadline. They're trying to get content out there so quickly. So if you're easy to work with, they're going to come back to you over and over again. It doesn't necessarily, you know, that's really the thing is if someone asks you for images, get them quickly. If someone asks you for something, jump on it quickly, because yes, that's, that's in my opinion, how you kind of build that relationship is just be easy to work with and get people what they need quickly. Cause they're on, like I said, they're on a deadline. They're trying to just get content out there quickly and a lot of it a day. Um, but yeah, for TV, you know, I, I do agree that nowadays is a great time to pitch TV because Zoom is making it so easy. I yeah. find that kind of how-to segments always do really well. So this is something that's always kind of a conversation, like with that tea brand, for example, I would almost recommend pitching something like how to make, you know, your own calming tea at home during a stressful time. And then I get questions, well, why would I give away my secrets? Well, the thing about it is one, you're not gonna tell them exactly how to do it. And two, the reality is people are really lazy. They're not gonna make their own tea. They're gonna go buy your tea. So, you know, that's what I always kind of find. Um, I work with like a lot of restaurants and I work with like a specialty food brand. And that's how we get those TV segments is we, we pitch how-to products either how to make, you know, a certain product or how to make something with this product. So that's another thing you can do is like, how do you use your tea in unusual ways? Like maybe you can add it to, I'm just saying baked goods, or I don't know what it might be, but I find that for TV, any type of how to segments usually do really well. Okay. Okay. All that's great advice. It does make me realize, I mean, you guys are such a wealth of information that, you know, there comes a point when you really do need the help of a professional. Um, so what could you guys give me, give us some feedback of like, at what stage of your business uh, should you really think about hiring a professional in PR so that you can actually get to the level that you need to get to? I mean, I honestly think it's as easy as when you can afford it. It's like anything yeah. else, you know, when you first start out, you're probably going to be doing a lot by yourself, but as you kind of make more money, I mean, this is how I kind of did it is as I was taking on more clients. I sort of like started to get rid of the things I don't like, like I hate doing social media. So when I could afford it, I started hire. I have someone who does, you know, my social media. So I think that that's kind of honestly how it works is just as you can start to afford more, um, you know, maybe you start doing PR and you, you really love it. And that's something that you want to keep doing your own, but you want to, you know, get rid of social media. So I think, I mean, I don't have like an exact science to it. That's just kind of what I recommend is just as you start making more money, you can start spending all your time doing the things that you love and the things that you're the best at and start getting rid of all the rest. Like I always say for me at this point, I mean, I seriously only pitch. I have people that help me with everything else, sometimes even write the pitches. And all I do is pitch because I feel like that's what I'm best at. And so I try to, I try to have other people do everything else. 
Okay, that's really great advice. Um, I think, Catherine, did you have an additional question? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, you were talking about products and services. How about events? How, how would you go about uh, marketing online events? Okay, this is like a, a little, I mean, it's not difficult, but I think that even with events, what I found to be the most successful, even, you know, online or offline, is to really pitch the people involved in the event. So a lot of times, you know, I'll pitch the people and say, this is what they can talk about. And oh, by the way, they're participating in this event. So I find that kind of offering them as an expert and then getting that plug for the event is usually the best way. Um, you know, not always, sometimes you can just kind of pitch information about the event and people will cover it, but just make sure you're pitching publications that make sense. So like if it's a fashion event, you know, kind of pitch people that cover fashion business, but a lot of times it's offering people as experts. I'll uh, use an example. So I did, I helped the PR team um, do the PR for Magic, which is the big fashion trade show in February in Vegas before the whole world flipped upside down. That seems like it was like seven years yeah. ago. And what we did is instead of just pitching like, oh, magic is happening, here are the dates, we pitched different experts. So we pitched the, foot, the, the president of footwear as someone that could talk about, you know, trends in footwear for 2020. We pitched the women's ready to wear director as someone who could talk about these trends. And so it wasn't just like, here's the event. It was instead, here's useful information. And oh, by the way, this is associated with an event, if that makes sense. Perfect. And also, and also, Catherine, I think to Rebecca's point, I think when you're doing events, it's always good to get media partners because they may help, they may be involved. And what, what I did once uh, with one media partner, I had the editor, the fashion editor walk on the runway because they, Yeah. I'm surprised on how many editors and bloggers love themselves so much. <laughs> oh yeah. They will write about you if you put them on a fashion show. I once had a fashion show. I put all fashion bloggers. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you write a good idea right there, like so you'd be surprised that sometimes they love themselves so much. They'll be like, Oh my God, I'm writing about this. Cause I came out in it. Yeah. So Backstage reception, idea, you know, like get media partners and stuff like that would help. Thanks. That's, that's a really, yeah, that's a really great tip. Well, we're at the end of our hour and Rebecca, oh, this God. has just been such wonderful information. Thank you so much for sharing uh, all these wonderful tips with us. Um, I want to uh, turn it over to Beth for a minute because she um, will be able to announce the winner of the consultation with Rebecca. Yay. Yeah, so congratulations, Heather Aker. She's, um, her company name is Young Nolan Inc. And she is a handbag designer. So congratulations, Heather. I'm sure you're going to get a wealth of knowledge working one-on-one -on -one with Rebecca. And then I would like to also uh, announce, especially to our attendees, we've got such a great group of people um, watching the webinar today. Uh, we, fa you know, Fashion Mingle is a platform for fashion industry professionals that, you know, our main goal is to connect you to the resources you need to grow your business. And so we want to provide an opportunity for you to network with each other. So uh, starting June 3rd on Wednesdays, we're going to be having a Mingle happy hour at 5 p.m. Uh, every Wednesday night, um, New York times at Eastern time. And um, they, so we'll be sending out more information in our newsletter about how to become a part of the Mingle a Happy Hour. But this is for our Fashion Mingle community. This is to help you make connections, especially during this time uh, where we're not getting to see each other face to face. And it's also going to be a great way for you to connect with people in other cities um, you know, outside uh, where you live. So we're excited to get started with this and um, make sure that you sign up for a Fashion Mingle profile so that you can get our weekly email and that's where you'll get information about the Mingle Happy Hour coming up. So uh, I just want to really give a shout out, uh, give a big thank you to our Mingle Mastermind team. We really appreciate you guys coming on every single Friday with all of your wonderful advice and knowledge. And thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing all those great tips. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Okay, have everybody have a great Memorial Bye. Day weekend. <laughs>